Does she like to be held in the feet? Sit yeah, Flora. I can hold put her in my lap. No, that's all right. Flora, away from the table, please. No, he he's 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 Flora. Yeah, I'd be delighted to hold her. Oh, if you want to, but she's not supposed to do this. She's not. No, but that's all right. Okay, come on. Up. This smart. <laughs> she knows a softie when she finds one. Yeah. Hello. I think she likes your mustache. I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. In the months and years after the 1969 Stonewall Uprising, thousands of radicalized young activists founded hundreds of new organizations across the country dedicated to the fight for gay liberation and equal rights. For old-line homophile organizations like the Daughters of Belitis and the Mattachine Society, the transformed landscape brought new energy, but also very real challenges. Ruth Simpson was born on March 15, 1926, in Cleveland, Ohio. She joined the New York chapter of the Daughters of Belitis in the late 1960s. By then, she held a top executive position at a high-profile public relations firm. The Daughters of Belitis, or DOB for short, was the country's first organization for lesbians founded in San Francisco in 1955. Ruth attended DOB social gatherings and discussion groups, and before long, she took over as president of the chapter opened a community center for lesbians, and pushed the organization to join post-Stonewall protests challenging discrimination. The chapter's more political agenda led to internal conflicts, unwanted attention from the police, and meddling by the FBI. So here's the scene. It's the dead of winter in 1989. I've just taken a two-hour bus ride from Manhattan to Woodstock, New York, a small town nestled in the Catskill Mountains. Ruth picks me up at the bus station, and we drive a short distance to the small, cozy house she shares with Ellen Poville, her partner of many years, and Flora, their very friendly poodle. Ruth is a small woman, although she's quick to note that she's not as thin as she once was. She's in her early 60s and has short gray hair. Ellen is several years younger. She's tall and thin, made even taller by a thick crown of brown hair. As usual, I'm starved. Thankfully, Ruth has prepared lunch, and we talk while we eat. Ellen mostly hovers in the background, occasionally pouring wine for Ruth and ginger ale for me. Before I dive into my sandwich, I clip a microphone to Ruth's sweater and press record. Interview with Ruth Simpson and Ellen Poville, February 9th, 1989, Woodstock, New York, 1 p.m., tape one, side one. Interviewer, Eric Marcus. I was, at that time, totally closeted. And then I heard a radio interview with Martha Shelley, who used to be uh, active in the uh, gay movement. And she gave the name of Daughters of Belitis and uh, the address and the time and day of meeting. So I just went there one night and uh, felt I had come home to my people. Can you describe that meeting for me? It was in a, on a very dark street in Manhattan. It was on the second floor. Were you fearful going there that first time? Mm-mm. No. Let me explain about my being closeted for so long. It was... I never, never had guilt feelings. Or I never thought, I'm so peculiar, what am I doing in the world. But I was very aware of the uh, sociological dangers involved with getting a job. And of course I held, at the time I went to DOB, I held a top executive position on Madison Avenue. So you, you had to be concerned going because of your job. You put it in a nutshell, which is where it belongs. Um, if you'd been open. Mm-hmm. You couldn't have gotten your, your jobs. No, I'll, okay. I'll tell you uh, what happened about when I did come out of the closet. Uh, anyway, so, no, I wasn't frightened. I felt a certain sense of adventure to walk into a room and look around you and see a hundred women and say, my God, there are this many of us in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what was discussed at that meeting? Mostly it was 
a rap session. At that time, DOB was not very political. There was a lot of talk about uh, women who uh, thought they were straight but were having doubts. There were a lot of stories about uh, what happened when I told my parents. It was pretty much all on a personal level. Mm -hmm. I assume a lot of people who attended meetings were people who were risking their, their careers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A lot of women were frightened to be there. Uh, were some of them married? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Yes, there were, there were straight women who came. Uh, straight meaning they were straight or they were leading a straight lifestyle? They were living straight lifestyles. Thank you for making that fine distinction. <laughs> Anyway, they talked a little bit, bit about um, organization, administration of the organization. And uh, I said that I would uh, be program director after about my third meeting. So you got very heavily involved very fast. Mm hmm Yeah. So you became president in... In 69. You became president in 69. Mm -hmm. When in 69 did you become president? Was it before the riot at Stonewall or...? Oh, yeah. It yeah. was. Yeah. What did, what did Stonewall represent or did it not represent anything? Oh, no, it, it, it very definitely represented, hey, there's a war on out there. <laughs> and um, s keep in mind, when you have, in those times, a lesbian organization that might have uh, three to 500 women at a weekend dance, you had a lot of people that didn't want to hear from politics. Mm -hmm. And some of the women really resented it when we started to get political. Where did your political interest come from? Well, I was very peripherally involved in the black movement. I would go out and ring doorbells and get people to join NAACP, all of this sort of thing. This was during the same time, or this was earlier? Earlier. Mm -hmm. My parents, fabulous, fabulous people. Uh, were very active in the very early days of the labor movement in this country. When I was 12, I saw my first police brutality on the picket line. I saw my father get beat. I held my mother's hand and ran from tear gas. So I had that, all that kind of thing in, in my background, so I sort of just stepped back and for more years than I should have. But then, when I went to DOB, I thought, you know, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to see. It shouldn't be that others have to, other, the young people have to go through this sort of pain, this psychic pain. And the deceit and the lies and the, uh, the broken families. We reached an age from like 18 to 72. Mm. It was wonderful. At the time you were had, there were dances every every week. Or every, uh, yeah. Where did you hold the dances? Well, in '70 we got the loft mm -hmm. down in in uh, Soho. We were so glad because we knew how important it was to have a home. We ordered lumber, built partitions, we made a kitchen, we made a. A, a library. Uh, I mean, it was a great space. That was a critical part of your of your organization, the social function. Oh yeah. We started to get more and more political. Can you characterize what more political meant? What what was that? We instead of saying, "Well, I so and so and my parents," and uh, we started talking about we. Uh, we we need we need to help each other on a broader scale. We need to to understand who, what institutions are responsible for the for continuing this oppression. I don't know if you know about the Fidel Facts demonstration. No, tell me about that. What was that? Fidel Facts was this organization. It was headed by an ex FBI man. He had made a speech and was quoted in the Wall Street Journal. They screened applicants to make sure they weren't homosexual for major corporations. And he had this line, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, then it's a duck. 
So we decided to have a demonstration outside of what we called fiddly facts. And GAA rented this marvelous duck costume. And we met on Times Square and we had our signs, fiddly facts, uh, oppresses uh, uh, the homosexual population. I forget all the signs we had. And we had a bullhorn. And so we started marching. We uh, walked over to their offices, went up into their offices, and said we want to meet with whatever his name is, the head of Well, he is out of town. He wasn't there. And we wanted to cause a stir, but we didn't want to be arrested because these arrests took a lot of time out of your work, out of your... And you were yeah. still you were still at your advertising. Right? Yeah, yeah. Was this on your lunch hour? Was it? it yeah, this was. We did a lot of lunch hour, a lot of lunch hour uh, uh, demonstrations. So as far as your colleagues knew, you left the office to go to lunch. Yeah, yeah. But and where were you? Yeah, I was walking beside a duck. <laughs> wow, what kind of feelings were you left with after something like that? It must have been. Oh, the adrenaline was really surging. It was good feelings, good feelings. Anyway, so that's the sort of thing that uh, we were involved in. And uh, well, one night I had, uh, I had some of the uh, men who had been picked up in the backs of cop cars and beaten and left out on the piers to talk about what, what happens. And there were men from a political organization, and I said, I don't want to predict negativity, but once we start really getting political, we are going to face this sort of thing. And sure enough, we did. I mean, uh, the first time cops walked into DOB, and that was before we had the loft, I was scared. I, I didn't have a dress rehearsal for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Why did the police show up at... Uh... All right, we had... We had joined GAA in some of their demonstrations. In 69? Mm-hmm. And at this time, in my fine Madison Avenue office, the phone rang, and uh, I answered, and he said, Hello, this is uh, Sergeant Kelly from the 19th Precinct, and uh, I'd like some information. Are you president of DOB? I said, uh, Just a minute. Where, how did you get this number? He said, Oh, we have our ways. And he said, well, uh, I'd like to uh, know how many women are members, uh, what your dues are. I said, you can get any information that you are supposed to have from our attorney. This was like, we met on Thursdays. This was like on Tuesday. That Thursday, the door came open and there are two cops. Well, the women just froze. We were in the middle of a discussion of uh, how the psychiatric profession oppresses us, organized religion oppresses us, how the police oppress us, how uh, we have to hide our, our basic identities where we work. So I walked toward the cops. I had no idea what, what was going to happen. I walked toward them and I said, uh, you are here illegally. Do you have a search warrant? And who are you? I want your badge numbers. And the one had, was chewing gum and it had a squawk box going real loud. And I said, can you turn that down? He just you know, ignored me. And so they came walking and I found myself walking backwards. And uh, Ellen, Ellen was there. In fact, I had just met Ellen. Ellen Poville. Yeah. yeah. This, 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 Ellen. this treasure here. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, uh, I said, okay, get your coat. We're taking you in. You? I said, why? I said, I'm not going anywhere with you until I talk to our lawyer. And he stood, he had his billy club, and he stood holding it like this, and he said, uh, Look, lady, I don't want to have to break your horn. Horn is police ease for the skull. I, and he said it softly. I said, what did you say? Would you, I didn't hear you. Would you, you know, I didn't, I really, I didn't know what, how feisty I could be and, and be legal with. 
and he was starting to get very annoyed. So uh, he said, okay, I'm writing you out a summons. And it was a summons to appear in court for a violation of the occupancy sign. He, he said, again, he said, all right, come on, I'm taking you in. Seventy women stood as one person and said, if you take her, you take all of us. Well, these two cops just blanched. You know, what were they going to do with a patrol car and 70 women? I mean, it was, it was fabulous. The first appearance in court, Sergeant Kelly didn't appear. This is part of the harassment. They get you to come to court, and then the, the so-called uh, arresting officer doesn't show up. So we had to come back a second time. And by this time, we had arranged a, um, a big demonstration. We had the courtroom full of, of people. We called the press. And uh, when they said, well, the defendant, please stand up and come forward, the whole courtroom, holding hands, the whole courtroom stood up. So the judge was, oh, what, what a what a case he was. He saw this and he immediately stood up and in the most dramatic gesture with robe flowing, he said, this is not theater. <laughs> so anyway, so that, the, the uh, charges were ultimately dismissed. And this was what they did. They would bring people into court on charges and then dismiss them and then bring them in again and dismiss what them. What purpose did it serve? Who was who Harassment. Was and this was orchestrated by whom? Was it, it was government sanctioned for? Oh, sure, of course. The uh, for some reason the um, New York Police Department was very threatened by gay women, by lesbians. GAA and DOB had this arrangement because we knew if cops came to GAA, they'd soon be coming to DOB. So they would send runners over. And if we had cops, this was how often they came to harass us. Was we, we once was, a month, once every few months, twice uh, a year? Uh, maybe once every month and a half. Mm -hmm. And then we would send runners over to let them know the cops were here at our place. Anyway, that sort of galvanized DOB, the, the women. We were also in infiltrated by... We knew one woman was uh, FBI. How did you know? Once the OB was disrupted, that woman turned up in another organization, a totally different persona, pulling the same tactics. Another gay organization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, her whole thing was disruption. Disrupting, you know, that's the, that's the classic handbook strategy. Uh, disrupt. You begin to realize and to recognize the uh, straight out of an agent's handbook some of the tactics that were used. Our phone was tapped. At that time, through, believe it or not, a mafia connection, we got a number that you could call, and if your line was tapped, you got a siren sound. So we knew our phone was tapped. Now, at our apartment on Central Park West, Ellen, I was at home, and Ellen was at her office, and she called to say she's going to be working late, and how was my day, and we chatted. And at the end, uh, I said, I love you, and she said, I love you, and a man's voice said, I love both of you. And then we started getting harassment calls that were scary as hell. Uh, this one man called and said, uh, you know, there are plenty of people working with the FBI and the CIA, and uh, they want to know about people like you, and sometimes people like you end up dead. Oh, it was, it was heavy. What happened with your job at this time? Were they aware at work? What was going no, on? No, no. At this point, I still was not, I still had not come out in my job. Uh, well, I had been on radio interviews, BAI. Mm -hmm. uh, my name had been around, and I, I 
was just lucky, you know. That so anyone researching could have found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at this time, it was known that there were gay and lesbian groups, right. and they were titillating to to the average viewer. ABC called. So anyway, I went to this woman vice president and said, I don't mean to unburden my personal life on you, but when I told her who I was and why I was telling her because I was about to appear on a network. And she was your superior at, it at was, this company? She was an uh, uh, executive vice president. Uh -huh. And she said, well, I think you're very courageous and uh, I'll be watching. I said, I, you know, I owe you, and I have an ethical obligation. I, I want you to hear it from me rather than a, from a client who happens to be watching and says, guess who we saw and, mm -hmm. and guess what she is. And we had very big, fancy clients. So anyway, I went and was on the show. What, what kinds of things did they ask you? About? They asked all the usual things, you know. Uh, like? Like, uh, when did you first discover that you were a lesbian? And at this point, I, I, I was being very light with it. I said, it's very hard to say, could you tell me when you first discovered that you were heterosexual? If you are. You know, and it was all, but it was, it was all light. Mm -hmm. There was, it was not, not hostile. And I conducted myself with what I thought was great dignity. So I got back to my office and uh, it was an early morning show. So I got in the office a little before nine, about 9.15, the phone rang and it was the vice president saying I saw the show, I thought you were very eloquent and elegant and uh, I, I uh, admire your courage. Two weeks later I was fired. I was their top woman PR executive. I never got another job in PR. What did you do then for a living? I worked as a waitress. After her stint as a waitress, Ruth Simpson found a home at a more accepting company, first as a receptionist, and then as a textbook writer and anthology editor. In 1976, Ruth and Ellen moved to Woodstock, New York. Ruth became president of the local library, taught writing workshops for older folks, and for two decades hosted a weekly show on local access TV called Minority Report. Ruth left the Daughters of Belitis in the spring of 1971, resigning along with the rest of the New York chapter's leadership as members fought over the direction of the organization. As my 1989 interview with Ruth was winding down, the conversation turned to Ruth and Ellen's other pets, two deer mice named Tarzan and Viva, and getting to the bus stop in time for my return trip to Manhattan. I was about to turn off the tape recorder when I asked Ruth if there was anything else she wanted to share with me, and there was. She told me about a phone call she got from her old boss, the one who had praised her for her ABC television appearance. This was about three years after Ruth was fired. She called me and she said, Ruth, I have to, she said, I haven't been able to live with myself. She said it wasn't my decision, but I was, I was the instrument uh, for which you were fired. And she said, uh, I really have great admiration for you and I want you to know that I'm a lesbian and have been for all my adult life. <laughs> At that time, she had lived with this woman for, I think, like 12 years. Ruth Simpson died in 2008. She was 82. Her partner, Ellen Poville, still lives in the home she shared with Ruth in Woodstock, New York. Ellen is 81 and works as a videographer. In a recent phone call with Making Gay History, we asked Ellen if she had a partner. She explained that after 37 years with Ruth, she wasn't interested in dating. She said, I've been with the best. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History possible. Our new senior producer, Nahani Rouse, producers Josh Quinn and Janelle Anderson, deputy director Inga Dataya, audio engineer Jeff Town, researcher Brian Faree, photo editor Michael Green, and our social media team, Christiana Pena, Nick Porter, and Daniel Lorenko. 
Special thanks to Jenna Weiss Berman and our founding editor and producer, Sarah Burningham. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives at the USC Libraries. Season six of this podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, the Small Change Foundation, Irwin and Andrew Press, and our listeners, including Mary Cadigan and Lee Wilson. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Lee. Stay in touch with Making Gay History by signing up for our newsletter at makinggayhistory.com, by finding us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or by emailing us at hello at makinggayhistory.com. We love your supportive emails, so don't hesitate to write. Head to our website to find previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people and stories we feature. And please subscribe to Making Gay History wherever you get your podcasts. So long. Until next time.